Now, we are in maybe the endings of a series called Crossroads. These are moments where we encounter Jesus, engage life with Jesus, and we then need to make a decision either to go God's way or our own way. Our guiding scripture was Jeremiah 6.16. This is what it says. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads. Look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. And then he says, travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. Wow, we need that at this time. And you may have a big decision you need to make. Or God may be calling you a certain way and you need rest in it. This is what you do. But here's what people were doing then and I think still do today. But you reply, the prophet writes, no, that's not the road we want. But what if you say yes to God? What if you said yes to the direction he wants to take you, even if you can't see the end? Or your expectations are, aren't met, or you're afraid, or you have fear or worry, or you wonder what might happen or what could be. I wonder what causes you to pause, be frozen. What causes you to sit and not go on the mission he has for you? Well, our story today is found in Acts chapter 1, the first 11 verses. It's Jesus encountering some of his disciples and pushing them towards mission when they just want to sit and wait for him to come back. Uh, let me read it to you. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Luke is writing and saying, hey, I'm writing this to you to let you know all about Jesus, what he's called us to, and the, the places he want to take us. He writes then, says, during the 40 days after he suffered and then died, he appeared because he rose from the grave to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And here's what he talked to them a lot about, the kingdom of God. He gave them perspective and mission. And then it says in verse four, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And Jesus replied back to them, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. And then he says, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, it says, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. And they could no longer see him. They look up and they see him go and he disappears. And it says in verse 10, as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. And those angels said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. It seems to me that they got all these instructions. They're empowered to do the great task and mission, but they're more concerned about when he would come back and wanting to know when he would come back than what he wanted them to do and the people he wanted them to reach. I wonder about you today, if you connect or resonate with any of that. Hey, let me tell you a little bit of the Journey Church story. It was in the summer of 2011 
that a small group of people start meeting in this building right here at the shops at exit 24 for prayer, worship, a little word. We would write on a prayer board all the prayers for our community, for one another, and pray through them. It was a great time, kind of like we're doing at 6.30 Sunday nights at the Current Journey Church in the grass area. Join us. Wow, and then after that, we would work our way towards an October launch of the church. Days before the launch in October, I had someone from the city come in and say that we were not allowed to meet here, that we didn't have the right permits, and I was in shock. But he said, hey, listen, come in Monday. We'll take care of it. You'll be fine. Because we had the open house that weekend and the big actual regular old standard launch the following Sunday. I was devastated. We had kind of an open house. They let us meet, but not, uh, you know, sit in chairs, and it worked fine. But then on Monday... He told me, not only will you not be able to meet this coming Sunday, but you can't meet anymore until you get the right permits. That's going to at least take a few months, which it did. Wow, so I was devastated. But what do I do? All my expectations were blown. I wanted to give up and stop. I connected with a group of pastors and I asked them, what do I do? I'm new at this. And they said, hey, listen, we'll pray for you. Now, nothing against all of them, but man, I was devastated even more. I did not know what to do. I sat here in the parking lot and almost became frozen, paralyzed in the position I was in because my expectations were blown. I had fear, worry, I was anxious, and I felt like I had disappointed so many people. My wife was working, I couldn't go cry on her shoulder and other people. So I texted a friend, Kenner Gottsman. He was one of my students in school, and uh, he was a pastor down at Rogue Valley Fellowship just a couple miles down the road road where we currently meet and he said Ron in the text hey come down and see me we just got out of a meeting and somebody here wants to see you and so I did I drove down there and I got in the car here and uh, down to see Kenner so I get in the car and I decide to not let that fear or expectation paralyze me in the position I'm in. I tend to do that. I get paralyzed because my expectations weren't met or I'm afraid to do something or I feel I don't know how to do it. Even in this case, I would get a letter um, that was from a man who said how disappointed he was in me as a leader. And quite honestly, it made me want to give up um, and, and just stop without even really having started. Um, One of the things that can cause you to freeze and never get in the car and go anywhere is those fears, that anxiousness, that worry, that expectations you had. Because I thought everything would work out perfectly. If God put me on mission and called me to do this, then why wouldn't everything be laid out perfectly? And when that doesn't happen, Many of us give up. One of the little extras I want to give you even right now as we take this drive a couple of miles down the road is always do the next thing. And do the next thing according to the last thing that God told you to do. I think that's one great principle that you could apply or at least have it play out. This drive that I went on there now was an opportunity for God to reinforce all of his promises. And the last thing that he told me to do, Ron, I want you to go and plant this church. It's also the place where the enemy can now tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. Like, wow, he's telling me, don't go talk to Kenner and these guys because they're just a bunch of pastors and they're going to pray for you, but offer you no hope or help. And again, I think I'd said earlier, I don't want to hear another cliche. I need help. And so sometimes that drive, like what happens in that space between where things seem to fall apart and you now just sit and wait, or you move forward, that space can often be encouragement or it can be discouragement for you. So it's something to remember when you enter in to God's call on your life, that mission. So this drive, it's not very long, it's not very far, 
but my mind was reeling and I was desperate and just felt destroyed and defeated in so many ways. But you keep going. What else am I going to do at this moment? I have no clue what to do. I have no way to fix it. I don't know where to go to get help at the moment. And so somebody offered some encouraging words in a text and said, Hey, somebody wants to see you. Come and, uh, you know, come and meet him. I wonder what happens to you when your expectations aren't met or things don't work out. What happens when you are bombarded with fear or worry or anxiousness? What if it's the defeating words of people? What if it's the discouragement from what they say or how maybe they don't help? And so I approach this driveway. I see the church right here and I pull in and some of that anxiousness and fear begins to well up even more. And so I get here and then I wonder what's next and what will happen. So I get here and I'm wondering what's going to happen. I get to the door and before I even go in, I wonder, like, again, what are they going to tell me? What do I do? But I remember God has called me to a mission. So again, do the next thing according to the last thing that God told you. But I wonder, what's your door? What's the thing that stops you? If you reflect back on the story in Acts, I know they were sitting on a rock. It says they were standing there gazing up into the sky. What's your rock? What's the thing that keeps you paralyzed in the position you're in and not move forward in the things, the mission that God has for you, but causes you to go another way or sit and wait and do nothing? I wonder, what's your rock? What's your door? What's the thing that holds you back? So I get here, I walk through the door, and it was a little awkward at first because there was probably like five or six guys. And at the time, this was kind of their coffee area. Couches were in here. They get up. They give me a hug. I see Darren, another pastor in town, Ratcliffe, who uh, were friends, connected. That's who wanted to see me. Said hi to him. And uh, the guys ask, hey, Ron, what's wrong? They can tell, man, I am brokenhearted. And I tell them, and, and they knew about the church starting. So I tell them the quick story. And it was a weird moment. That, that weird pause that I didn't know what to do with. I think I had this expectation, great, they're going to pray for me, and I need that, and I love that, but I need something tangible right now. And Dave Boya, the pastor at the time, um, looked at Kenner, and there was an awkward moment, and he said, it's your call. And Kenner looked at me, and he said, hey, Ron, why don't you guys just meet here until that works out? You can meet here on Saturday nights. And I didn't know it, but right before I got there, they had just officially made Kenner Gottsman the pastor of Rogue Valley Fellowship. One of the first things that he did was help me stay on mission for God by going and getting a pair of keys and saying, just meet here Saturday, and you can meet here as long as you need to. That would have never happened if I would have sat and not continued with the mission that God had called me to, if I had sat on the rock or I had kept staring and gazing at something else, my expectations, and it would have frozen me right in that place, and I would have missed out on what God had. I wonder what your rock is. What door do you need to walk through, but you're just too scared to open it? Or your expectations were blown what thing has become that place or thing that makes you comfortable, complacent, familiar, lazy, afraid, overwhelmed, a failure that maybe paralyzes you into a place, waiting for something to happen, yet knowing God called you to go further, to do something greater 
Is there somebody that becomes that door, that rock, that place that keeps you frozen in place? Hey, this is the crossroad moment, the decision to either sit and stay paralyzed and frozen or get up and go on the mission that God has called you to. Let me give you some principles that Jesus gave his disciples and still are relevant for us 2,000 years later to help us go on mission and not sit and stay in the place we're at. So here's what's interesting, that decision to go for me and really for a community of people, Journey Church, um, brought us here for a few months till the permits worked out and we were able to go back to the shops at Exit 24. But here's what's really interesting, just years later, we would occupy this building for the past years. And then holding on to that, seeing what God would do and not sit in fear or expectation or worry or what others said, but moving forward with God, we're entering into that again as we are 30 days into a 90 day, you know, got to vacate the building. Uh, God is going to do something even greater, I believe. So I want us all to just continue to move forward, whether it's you as an individual or us as a church or you as a family, whatever that looks like. My desire is that we go and not stay in our position of expectation, fear, worry, whatever it is. I wonder again, what is your door? What is your rock? What is that thing or place or person that keeps keeps you in one spot and then uh, you feel though compelled to go on to what God wants you to do. What is that thing? Evaluate that with me. But Jesus does four things um, in this story that I want to comment on today that helps us move forward. One, Jesus with his followers and still does today, he brought clarity to the mission. Jesus spent those 40 days and years before preparing his people, you and I even today, for the mission over straining to predict the future. So preparation over prediction. Hey, this works today because I think we do the same thing during this pandemic time, especially. They said, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? And he replies, the father alone has authority to set those dates and they are not for you to know. But they spent so much time time, straining, asking, looking for that, that they got off mission. Jesus is preparing us for something greater. We always seem to want to know the when, when Jesus wants us to be a witness. And again, the pandemic has done this to us right now as a church, as the church um, in a big way concerning this. There's so much out there. Hey, listen, I think Jesus is coming back soon. I think he has been coming back soon for 2,000 years later. Once the guys, the, the, the followers watched him go, it was time to get to work. And I think we get so caught up at times on all the little predictions and nuances to that. I'm curious. I want to know. But we have a mission to accomplish, something he's called us to the disciples were maybe looking for a program, times and dates laid out. And Jesus says, don't worry about dates. You worry about destiny, what you've been called to do. Hey, we can be more concerned again about when he's coming back um, and not participate in what Jesus wants us to do and who to reach. And that's what I want to do as a church. Whether we're here or somewhere else, we want to be on mission. And so let's do that. Now, Jesus will speak concerning end times. I encourage you to look what he said up in the Gospels, like Matthew 24, 25, Luke 17, other places. He's going to speak to these things. He'll even say, hey, I don't know the time. Get to work. Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. And then he spends years showing them what to do, how to do it, and who to reach. And he releases them then to go and fulfill the mission that they've been called to. He gives them, it says in those verses, a kingdom perspective. This is all part of that preparation, the mission. 
building his kingdom, not my own. So for example, we're not here to build the journey kingdom or Ron's kingdom. We're here to build God's. So it doesn't matter where we're at. We're called to go. An individual and or a church unleashed with the wrong kingdom perspective becomes self-motivated, marking its territory, trying to make a name for itself. But wow, Jesus is unleashing us into the world with a message to share and a mission to accomplish. This unleashing free from restraint to have full effect. And so again, he is kind of bringing us and, and clearing us, clarifying to us his mission for us. Is there anything holding you back from that? Is it fear, worry? Is it some door or rock that keeps you paralyzed? But listen, the second thing that he really does for his followers here and us today is he reminds us that we don't go it alone. So two things come up in this story and others. One is that he will be with us. The same way he left is the same way he's coming. And he promised us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that he would not leave us alone in this mission. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 18, 19, 20, he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go be on mission and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, he says, I'm with you always. So when we make a decision at those crossroad moments to go on mission over building our own kingdom or whatever that looks like, he promises that we won't be alone. He teaches us that we will not be alone. For he says that he will be with us. But the second thing in there is that he says you will receive power. So when he says, hey, don't go it alone, he says, I will be with you and you will receive power. Remember, he said to his followers and to us today, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We need that power, that great holy power, because we have a great, huge task before us. This is God's power over my own strength. One of the reasons I seem to not move forward in the mission at times is because I don't think I'm strong enough to do it. And here's the truth. <laughs> You're not. This is something that you need God's power for. Are you attempting this great work in your own power as an individual if God has called you to something? And us as a church... Moving forward, you know, we have to go and find another place. It's going to involve new things, but we cannot do it in our own power. We need to do it in God's. So he clarifies mission. He promises and tells us to not go it alone. He promises us his presence and his power. And the third thing he does in the story is he lays out a plan. It's to be a witness. He tells us what to do. He says, go to Jerusalem. That's your little surrounding area, your community. Go to Judea and Samaria. That's the outskirts around you. And then he says, and go to the ends of the earth. Go everywhere. This is when we go on mission. This is where some of you may feel compelled right now to go to another country to do a great work for God. And you need his power because he wants you to do a huge, great task. Maybe this is some of you going across the street. That street could be that great man chasm. I wonder if something's stopping you from engaging with your neighbor or neighbors on mission to tell them about a great God. And maybe there's something that keeps you on the other side of the door and not going out across the street. It's so simple and strategic, this plan is. Go everywhere. It's not just a foreign field. Hey, as I just told you, it starts right at home. Maybe it's to your own family or to your own, again, neighbor or at your job. I wonder, maybe something you could think about with me. Are you thinking outside the box? Is there anywhere you said you would never go? Maybe that's the place where God is calling you. And I wonder if you're willing to go that way or if something is stopping you like the disciples. 
And realize this, it's not always easy. When God called us to start the church, it obviously was not easy. It was hard. In Jerusalem for Jesus, this is where he was killed. In Judea, this is where he was rejected. In Samaria, this is where he was hated. The ends of the earth, there were other people there. It was unknown there. Hey, if it was hard for Jesus and the disciples, it's probably going to be hard for us. That's why we need him. We need his power. But here's the fourth thing I want to remind you of. In all of that, Jesus said, get to work. Why are you standing here? The angels had to come and say, staring, gazing, looking into heaven. They basically tell the guys, stop straining, stop standing, stop sitting on the rock, go through the door and get started. What are you waiting for? I think sometimes if I wanted to add another thing right here, it's sometimes I run needs a push in this direction. I needed it in the church. That's a whole other part of the story. I needed it in various moments concerning the church. I need it in my own life. Yesterday, my wife and I took one of our dogs to Lost Creek Lake. We rented one of those patio boats and we went out on the water and cruised around for four hours. And one of the things we did is we took our dog, put a life vest on her and then tried to get her into the water. But we realized this after a little bit, she wanted to go in but she needed a little help, a little push. Now, I didn't shove her in by any means, but she needed a little push that direction. And once she got in, she loved it. I wonder if you could think way back, maybe you're a guy or a girl that liked that other guy and girl and you told all your friends and you're standing around and you're afraid to go talk to her. And then all of a sudden, one of your buddies shoves you into her <laughs> and suddenly you're face, face to face. Sometimes we need a little push. One of the things that often stops me too is the fear of not knowing what I'm doing. I experience that with the church and I experience it in my life. I've had various friends and my wife is great at this. She's such an encourager and a pusher. And I remember one time wanting to uh, roof my house. And I have a friend, a contractor who said, Ron, you can do it. And I wanted him to help me. And he said, well, I'm leaving town. So he measured the roof with me. He helped me order all the materials and a dumpster, and then he had it all delivered at my house. And now something needed to be done. He helped me with windows. We took the old windows out, and then he kind of left me. And Heidi and I had to learn how to put the new windows in because you can't really have a house with no windows in it. I mean, I guess you could, but it was just going to be plastic if I didn't do something. Sometimes we need a little push. Are you staring, gazing? Do you need someone? I think it's a job sometimes for us pastors to give a little push with encouragement spiritually or maybe even challenging. Hey, during the pandemic, this may even be something that we need more. My job as a pastor right now, it's interesting. It's not really to get you to come. It's to get you to go. I wonder what that looks like for you. So the decision that these followers made at that point, even though they needed a little push from the angels because they were willing to just sit and wait for him to come back and predict the future and, and, and just sit there, they needed a push to go. You know, next Pentecost happens. 3,000 are saved. Healings happen through the book of Acts. Thousands more are saved later on. They find favor with leaders, opportunities for ministry. Stephen is stoned and killed by some people, but he does it in joy. Needs are met over and over again. Saul turns into Paul because he's converted into a Christian. The dead rise. People escape from prison. God's word and gospel goes out to the world despite the struggle and persecution. They survive riots and shipwrecks. They're in prison and get out. And God is on the move. Why? Because they got a little push. The mission was clarified. They didn't do it alone. And they got to work. Hey, our mission here at Journey is to help people find Jesus. And then to be formed by him 
into the likeness of him. That's what we're calling you to. That's what we're calling us to. And the building doesn't matter whether we meet here again or not. We want to be on mission. What does it look like starting Monday for you? It starts personally, you and your Jerusalem. Are you willing to accept the mission and go? Does God still need to prepare you in some way? Is something keeping you frozen? What's your door? What's your rock? Where are you staring and gazing when you should get going? Do you have a kingdom perspective or are you trying to build your own? Do you need a push in some way? Hey, maybe we can help you with that. Are you willing to follow God's plan for your life because you're at the crossroads and use his power? Or are you wanting to do your own in your own strength? What if we all accepted the mission of God to help more people find Jesus and grow into the likeness of him. And if that's true, then we were unleashed into this world. Would it change anything? Would it change tomorrow? My answer would be it would. We saw it in the books of Acts and we can see it again today. So my prayer is that God unleashes his power on you and whatever is stopping you, that you leave that behind and go in God's direction. Just do the next thing. And if you're here listening today, wherever you're at, and you are ready to make the decision to follow Jesus. And I pray that you do that. Recognize you're a sinner, that he is your savior and can save you from your sin, and then wants to unleash you into the world so that more people can find Jesus and you can continue to be formed by him into the likeness of him. Father, today, thank you so much Man, for this time that we could share the story that you began and are continuing in the life of Journey and these incredible people. God, for everyone that is frozen, man, staring, gazing with expectation, with fear, whatever it is, God, free them from that and help them make a decision to follow you in to your mission for whatever you have for them. For those that are afraid to cross the road to their Jerusalem, Your neighbor, God, help them be compelled to go because they serve a great God who gives great power to do a huge, great task. And Lord, if there's anyone, again, that wants to surrender their life to you today, man, be with them and show them your path. God, we want to come alongside them and, uh, and save them, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have made a decision like that today, please let us know in one of our platforms. Thank you again for all your love support and giving. You matter to us. We love you. You're making a difference. So thank you so much. Let's worship.